I trust in God, he never fails. Amen. I like that part where it said, I sought the Lord, and he heard me. And so uh, keep that in mind as I go through this message today that's going to focal, focus on those who are single. Before you seek a mate, you ought to sought the Lord. Before you ask somebody to marry you, you ought to ask the Lord who you should marry. Okay. Y'all were happy a few minutes ago. <laughs> Grab a hold of your Bibles, your phone, or wherever it is, or your heart. If he says, I have his word hidden in my heart, repeat after me. Say, all scripture awesome. is God breathed awesome. and is useful for my teaching for my correction, for my rebuking, for my training in righteousness so that I may be thoroughly equipped for every good works. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, nearly 47% of the U.S. population are currently single. During the past half century, African Americans have become the most unmarried people in our nation. More than two out of every three black women are unmarried. And they are more than twice as likely as white women to never marry. So when I'm talking about those who are unmarried or who are single, we're not overlooking those who uh, are divorced, or those who have lost their mate. They are widows or widowers. Half of singles say they are not currently looking for a relationship or dates, while an, about a quarter say they are looking for either a committed romantic relationship or dates. And even a smaller number say that they are looking for a marriage. You know, you can talk to some people who are single, especially when they get a little bit older, and they say, I, I'm not, I ain't even looking for no husband. Or the women say that. No, you're not looking for no husband. But when somebody come up to you at HEB when you're over there by the tomatoes <laughs> and say hello. I saw you across the store and I thought you were so beautiful. And I just wanted to come and meet you. You, you had a tomato in your hand. You squeezed it so hard it just almost bust. You weren't looking for no husband, but now maybe the Lord is about to move in a supernatural way. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The younger age group are interested in relationships or date, but that's not the case for people who are 50 and older. They're not often either looking for either a relationship or dates. But wherever you find yourself in the single or even married world, I'm going to share with you God's perspective on male and female relationships. And then I'm going to give some guidelines to those who are single in case um, God decide to bless you with a mate that you can uh, have some ways of uh, making some good choices and avoiding uh, falling into the ditch regarding your relationship. So let's begin at the beginning. In the book of Genesis chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible tells us, so God, created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So this is talking about mankind. He created them male and female. And God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. 
Now, we're starting in the book of Genesis, and I'm talking to those who are believers. I'm talking to those who are believers. I am talking to those who are believers. Are you a believer in the house? And the reason I'm emphasizing that, because we live in a culture nowadays where there are those who don't even believe that God created men and women. They don't believe in God. They don't believe that, and if they say they believe in God, they say, I don't believe that God was the one who orchestrated creation because uh, we were, we evolved from a lower level of uh, a, a one cell amoeba. That's what they believe. And the reason they don't believe in God is because once you want to believe in God, then you got to believe in what he said. And then you got to believe in what he said he will do. And you got to believe at the outcome that he said there is a way that seems right to a man, but the end of it is destruction. If you don't believe in, he said, if you don't believe in me, you're not coming to heaven that I have created for you. You're going to hell. That's what God said. So they don't want to believe that. So they don't want to believe God. So now they all mixed up in almost everything. But God from the beginning said he created them male and female. And we are right in the middle of the greatest crisis we have in humankind because folks want to say, oh, well, it's not just male and female that he brought together. In chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord said, it is not good for the man to be alone, and I will make a suitable helper for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the fields and all the birds of the air. He brought them to, to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the, bird and the, the birds of the air, and the, all the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping... He took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he'd taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. He brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For she was taken out of men, and for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. God set this up for his creation. He set up man to rule and reign over the creation of the earth. God put the seed in every plant so that the plant can reproduce itself. You look at an apple, it's got an apple seed. You look at a peach, it's got a peach seed. You got a pecan, it grows, but it's also the seed. And in man, he put the seed so that man can reproduce and fill the earth with people that will glorify God. That was God's vision and God's purpose. And so if man is going to have the seed, he said, I'm going to give man something to plant the seed in. And he gave him a woman. So it takes a man and a woman to come together to procreate, to produce another person. A man and a woman. God said, this is my purpose and this is my plan. He didn't go and create Adam another man so they could hook up. Two men can't make no juice flow. You need a plug and a socket for electricity. So I don't know why people have got all confused. Oh, I know how because the enemy wants to confuse. Anything God wants to happen, the enemy wants to confuse it. Now think about it. If you have just two men and two women, you won't have any produced, any more humans produced and then there's no uh, being fruitful and multiplying as God wants. God wants the next generation to know him. 
So our young folks have been taught over the last generation, it's okay, it's okay, we got all these kind of genders. Listen, if you don't know who you are, somebody else will frame your thinking and try to tell you who you are. No, if you're a man, you don't know how to know if you're a man, man. You confused about who you are? That's because somebody confused you. Now those of us who are, are quite older, we never were confused by who we were. We didn't walk around talking about, I don't know who I am. I don't know what I am. When did that happen? So the first thing you need to know is who you are. And God said it's not good for a man to be alone. That's why there is a human desire to come together as male and female, to be fruitful and multiply, to have companionship and relationship to balance each other out as a family as we live out our lives and God made the woman different from the man <laughs> I heard one preacher say I don't want to rub my mustache against another mustache <laughs> he made us different on purpose to balance each other out now, neither Adam nor Eve had much choice of the mate they ended up with. God chose for them, and therefore, they were the ideal match. Now, today, we're given the privilege of making our own decisions and our own choices. But I want you to look at some comments and perspectives Solomon made in regard to marriage. In Proverbs 19, 14, he says, House and wealth are inherited from parents. But a prudent wife is from the Lord. A prudent wife, God is able to bring a prudent wife into a relationship. So as people of God and church folk, and that's why I'm, I'm going to emphasize that because the unchurched folks, the world folks, the culture have a whole different perspective about how you need to find a mate. You just need to look up and hook up. And then break up. And then look up and hook up again and break up again and look up and hook up. No, that's not God's plan. A prudent wife is from the Lord. Proverbs 31.10 says, A wife of noble character who can find her. She is worth far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. And then in chapter 18, verse 22, about the man, he says, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. Somebody say good thing. Good thing. And receive favor from the Lord. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. So the man ought to be looking for the wife. Now the, wife, the women are looking for the men and trying to find them a good thing. There was a reason these references spoke of a man finding a wife and not the woman finding a husband. In those days, women had little or no influence in determining who they would marry. Their husband would already be determined for them. They would uh, be set up. They wouldn't even know or meet their husbands until the wedding night sometimes. Therefore, in those times, you could go into a marriage by only looking at the package. And now people want to do that again. They just look at the package before they get it. Your dream package is wrapped. But sometimes inside the package, when you unwrap it, you got a nightmare. So unfortunately, there are many people who get married and then once they're married, they say, you know, I didn't sign up for all of this. This ain't what I thought it was going to be. Well, you never know what you think it's going to be, but you can make some good decisions before you get in there to eliminate a lot of the issues that you might have. Because all that glitter ain't gold. It'll look good from a distance. And listen, when you are dating, 
Dating is not designed to reveal, it's designed to conceal. Everybody put on their best behavior when they're dating. They don't tell you their, their worst parts. No guy's going to come up to you and say, listen, <clears throat> I know you'd like for me to be honest and open. Oh, yes, I like honesty. Well, I'm going to tell you that I beat my women. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you that I'm not going to work. And you're going to go to work and you're going to bring me all of your money. And then I'm going to go out and I'm going to spend it on other women. I just want to be open and honest with you so you know what you're getting. Is he going to tell you that? No, he's going to conceal that. He's going to say, baby, it's you and me, baby. It's you and me. I ain't never seen nobody like you before. You've been like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so it's not designed. She's not going to tell you she can't cook. And she don't clean the house. She ain't going to tell you that. And that she going to nag you and be asking you every time you turn around where you been, where you going. You say, hey, I went to the kitchen. <laughs> what you going to the kitchen for? She ain't going to tell you that. So there are a lot of people, reasons people get married. Sometimes they get married because they have a negative self-image and marriage is going to make you feel better, make you feel worthwhile. Somebody wants you. Some people get married because they have a fear of being left out. I'm going to be a bachelor forever or an old maid. Some people marry on the rebound. Somebody just uh, walked away from you and somebody else came and said, hey, baby. You say, okay, I'm ready. And some people get married because somebody asked them to marry them. You, you should never marry somebody just because they ask you. Hey, so what are you doing this weekend? Nothing. What are you doing? Nothing. You want to get married? Oh, Okay. Sometimes there's a fear of hurting another person. I don't want to let them down. They, they say they love me so much. In fact, I don't have nobody else. I might as well marry them. So today I'm going to help every single person who will listen and who will learn. Now I'm putting that in there. Who will listen and who will learn. I don't know how many people I've talked to that uh, they'll listen as long as they're not in a situation. And then when they get in a situation, they act like they have never heard it. So you listen. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got it, I got it. As soon as somebody come in, you just throw everything out the window. Oh, I got me somebody. <laughs> One day I was driving down a road that I've been down several times, and I was pulled over by a policeman. He asked me if I knew what the speed limit was, and I said, I, uh, no, I, I didn't see the speed limit sign. He said, I was doing 55 and a 35 and gave me a ticket. I couldn't imagine the speed limit was going to be 35 miles on that road. So when I got a chance, I went back and I looked and observed, and there it is, just as big as day, a, a speed limit sign that said 35 miles an hour. I never took notice of that sign, but my failure to see the sign and respond accordingly costs me. Things work that way in a relationship. There are many, many signs posted along the way in relationships, but like that speed sign, sometimes it's just there and we ignore it. There are signs before we get married, and there are also signs after we get married. We've done marriage counseling for a number of years, but often in that discussion, I say, did you notice that before you got married? Well, I saw it, Pastor. But I, I but, but what? But I wanted him. And now it's a problem. You saw it, didn't you? Yeah, okay. Well, listen, uh, that's a sign. And whenever you see a sign, you need to wonder about it. So this message is called Signs and Wonders. What is this sign telling me, and what do I need to do as a result of it? 
A sign is something that suggests the presence or existence of a fact or a condition or quality not immediately evident. There are signs all around us. They're just sitting at the stop sign. Or sitting at a stoplight, I noticed once that there are signs of information. A protected turn on green, that's what it said. That means that uh, it's protected on green. Uh, you have seen a left turn and it's got a yellow light there. It says you better watch out now. It's not protected. You don't have to right away, but you can go if you check it out. There are signs of instruction. This lane turns left. Signs that advertise. Signs that advise. So the ability to, to discern is important when it comes to reading and reacting properly to the signs and the conditions we observe. To discern means to recognize, pay attention, get acquainted with. It's a physical apprehension, whether through sight, touch, or hearing, to distinguish. I need to have some discernment. Proverbs 14, 18 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. So one of the most irresponsible things to do is to see a sign and then disregard his warning. You see a sign that says, there's ice on the bridge, go slow. You say, I don't care nothing about that, there ain't, ain't no way. Then you speed up. Then you end in the ditch. <laughs> Sometimes there are signs and then there's verbal signs and warning. It was just uh, last week uh, up here in our area the, 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 the street was flooded and there was a lady following the big uh, fire department uh, vehicle and, she got, and they got out and they said, don't go down there, lady, because you won't be able to make it. She said, I got to go. And then she just drove right on in there and then, then they stopped her and, and a car got stopped and they said, uh, we just told you don't do that. You say, I got to go. Well, no, you got, you got to go, but wherever you got to go to, you ain't getting there. Because you stuck, and now you have all this extra expense of towing your vehicle, getting it repaired, and all of that because you would not listen. And some people, they, they don't listen. You find, once you find somebody, especially if you've been a long time, you think it's the last bus coming. <laughs> and you don't listen. This is the last bus. And they don't want to listen. I'm thinking, you should listen. And we got to the point where uh, once we're in marriage counseling, uh, we don't even try to stop it because hardly anybody will stop, even if you give them a suggesting. Um, I think you might want to reconsider a little bit and take a little bit of time. And they'll be like, oh, Pastor, uh, you just don't know. I, I say, I know. <laughs> They're in the love. They, 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 uh, we, we're in love. We're in love, Pastor, love. And then two years later, when they come in for counsel, you know what I tell them? Where is the love? Where is the love? You said you give to me soon as you were free. Will it ever be? I said, uh, I ain't even talking about it. No, don't even talk about that. I meant you that before y'all got married. No, I ain't, don't even talk about it. But I said, no, 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 no. I, you said you was in love. Let love take care of it. One of the reasons we ignore signs is that we're in a hurry to reach our destination. So when it comes to relationship, there are signs all around us. They're like road signs. They say dead end. Some says do not enter. They're warning signs. Every single adult. So I'm going to tell you, if you're single and you are in a place where you are, may get married, you want to pay attention to this. Every single adult should have a list of non-negotiables, things that I will not negotiate. 
you ought to have your list. If you don't have a list now, you need to write it down. And even if you're a young person, you're a teenager, you're 16, 17, 18 years old, you need to start thinking about things that you will not compromise on in your relationships. So think about it before you get there so you don't have to try to work it out while you're right in the middle of the fire. While you're sitting around the fireplace with candlelights, it's hard to figure out what you're going to compromise on. These things should be, deal, uh, should be deal breakers for you. Once you determine that, you're going to say these are deal breakers. And when you recognize the behavior or conditions, uh, you will not allow this relationship to go any further. It's not going any further than this because I, I see something here that's a deal breaker for me. I don't care who you are. I don't care how cute you are. I don't care if you got pretty bow legs or in, in, in green eyes. Uh, we ain't going down there. And curly hair. You got good hair. You know what? I used to think that curly hair was good hair, but right now, any hair <laughs> is good hair. <laughs> if you got some hair, it's good hair. <laughs> Somebody say amen. amen. Non negotiables may be addictive behavior. Drugs, gambling, pornography, alcohol, cigarettes, or anything that's addictive, you may say, I don't want to deal with that. I'm not going to deal with that. Or some attitudes, jealousy, possessiveness, anger, rage, abusive behavior, verbal abuse, physical abuse, all of this. Now, nobody starts off on the first time they meet you with these uh, abusive behaviors. That progresses and you, as you continue to allow it because you don't want to lose them. He don't start off saying, you old ugly thing, you, why don't we get together? <laughs> he don't start off like that. What's wrong with you? You're, you're crazy. You don't have any sense. Can I get your phone number? <laughs> no, the very first time he says something that's offensive to you, you uh, uh, get him out your phone and block the number. Well, he didn't mean it. What do you mean he didn't mean it? He said it. You don't have to mean it. If you didn't mean it, you're crazy enough to say it. I don't need nobody crazy around me. How do, how do a woman end up with a man that's in her house abusing her kids and she, don't, and she let him do that because she want to keep that joker? What is wrong with you? He ain't that good. He ain't got no money. He's a broke man. He's living with you. I tell these women, what's wrong with you? How are you going to let a man come up in your house? So let me tell you something, women. It ain't even in my notes. Especially you shacking women. Anytime a man will move in with you, that means you're doing better than he's doing. Ain't no man going to move in with you if he's doing better than you. If he's got a better house and a better job, he ain't moving in with you. Why he going to give up his nice place to come live with you, with them children? That's the way it works. That, that's not going to change. Now, he may say, let's get a place together, let's get another place. But I ain't finna move up. A man don't do that. You don't do that. He said, no, I got a place. He'll move you in with him. But when he said, uh, I'm trying to get myself together. Listen, that's a sign. You trying to get yourself together? I don't need nobody trying to get themselves together. Uh, how old are you now? 45? The young lady said, I met this guy, Pastor, and uh, 
I say, uh, what do you think about him? Well, he has potential. I say, how old is he? 53? I say, he has potential when he's 18. And a 53-year-old man don't need to have no potential. He need to have arrived. What has he been doing for 53 years? Potential? No. Kick him out today. Block his number. Get him out your phone. What are you talking about? Potential. So committed believers, I'm talking to believers, will have a different list of non-negotiables. You want your mate to be saved and a committed believer. So there are some things you should observe. What, in their relationship, what is their relationship with God, and how can you tell? Because I'm going to tell you, if a man wants you and he's not saved and you are, uh, he can act like he's saved. He can act like he's a church, folk, a church person until he gets you. Now, this has happened time and time again. I've seen it over and over and over. So are they at least uh, committed to Christ as much as you are? Do they spend time with God? Did they just get saved the day before you met them? See, these, uh, some women, not, not you, but, but some women think, I'm going to help him get to the Lord. I'm going to help him. Oh, well, Pastor, he's nice. Uh, he, he, played, he prayed over the food. <laughs> Are they dedicated to the Lord and faithful to the church? Now listen, anytime a man, you, you meet a man and he starts coming to church with you, that means he didn't have no church. You just met him and now he said, oh yeah, I'm, I go to church all the time. And then he started coming with you. He ain't had no church. Because if he was committed to his church, he'd be asking you to come with him. I'm just telling you. Listen, women, when the pastor say, go to, go, to, go to Matthew's chapter 1, and he's looking at the table of content, Matthew, Matthew. Uh, he ain't been to church. That's a sign. Matthew, Matthew. He said, yeah, I know the Lord. I was reading the book of Job the other day. Are you equally yoked? Listen, just, in fact, let me just tell you this. Just because somebody is saved don't mean you need to marry them. That's not your only criteria for marrying somebody. You got some saved folks that won't be a good fit for you. Uh, see, y'all got saved. I'm just telling you, just because they're saved don't mean they're, they're right for you. <laughs> That's some other things you need to examine. Are they a tither? <laughs> Are they delivered? Are they a mature believer? They still got things they need to, un they need to take off. Do they pray? Do they love God with all their heart? Are they, uh, are they a working person? If it's a man, is he, is he a working man? Is he kind? He might still be, God ain't through with me yet. And I say, I ain't through with you either. <laughs> You're not compatible with everybody. Secondly, if women, I'm talking primarily to women, but men have to look at things as well. But women are the ones that are most vulnerable because uh, somebody's trying to find them and they want somebody to find them. Assess how they manage financially. Are they a spender or a saver? How, how, how will financial assets be handled? 
When you start talking about it and you start going down the relationship, is it mine or is it ours or is it yours and mine or what? Well, what is this? How about this person, this man that's talking to you? Is he able to hold down a job? Does he take personal responsibility for, for losing a job? Now, if he had four, uh, five jobs in two years, you might have an issue there. Might be unstable. Do they want to borrow money from you till they get paid? That's a sign. And how many of you heard this? Now, uh, now, now you y'all know how to you know how the man is. Now, sister, you supposed to be trying to help a brother. <laughs> Anybody ever heard that? Uh, that's a sign. Say no, this sister don't help no brother. This sister don't help no brother. This brother I need don't need no help. He's a real man. Say, uh, listen, uh, I told somebody the other day, uh, uh, you, when, you, when somebody asks you to go out, you don't pay, sister. You don't go Dutch. You don't pay. You ain't trying to, you, you pay yours, I pay mine. You ask me out. You pay everything. We ain't splitting this. If you don't pay, don't go. Well, I just don't, you know. No, no, you don't need nobody that bad. That's a sign. Now, people have, but things change, Pastor. There are some things that shouldn't change. There are some fundamental principles when you're trying to find, because you're trying to find somebody you want to live with and you want to enjoy for the rest of your life. You don't want no sorry person. It is a man's responsibility to take care of his wife, take care of his family. It is a man's responsibility to take care of his family. And man, if you can't take care of nobody, don't ask nobody to marry you. This one brother told me, I need a wife. I said, you don't need no wife right now. You can't take care of yourself. Take care of yourself. Get yourself in the responsibility. You broke. Broke man don't need no wife. And you don't need to marry a broke man. I mean, you, him broke, then you, uh, well, I'm working. Well, just stay, stay by yourself. Oh, y'all look at me. Well, you don't know, Pastor. Uh, okay, get, get your broke man. Man ought to be courteous. He still ought to open the door for you. Now, women that got to the place, they don't even know how to do that. He's getting in front of the open door. Where you going? I'm finna open the door. <laughs> I, can do, I can open the door myself. Let the man open the door. Be a woman. Women forgot how to drop their handkerchief. See, somebody don't know what that means. Let the man pick it up. I'm around here at the church. I see women grabbing tables. I say, wait, now put that table down. There are three, four guys standing right over there. I got it, Pastor. No, you ain't got it. That's a man standing there. That's a young man. That's a teenager. Get, get over here, man. Pick that up for these women. Women go, I got it, Pastor. <laughs> so no wonder you can't find nobody. You got to say, would you, would you get that for me? You talking about, ain't nobody ever talking to me, Pastor. They, they, he's, he's scared of you. <laughs> you got to say, uh, would you help me with this, please? Oh, yeah, I got, I got it, David. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. <laughs> See, y'all don't know how to do. Talk about, I don't have, nobody never say nothing to me. Y'all don't know how to do. When you get a little bit older and you want to get married, I say a little older, I'm talking about in your 30s and 40s, get a credit report on whoever you want to marry. 
They got history. They got stuff going on. They got skeletons in the closet. They got more, they got more skeletons than they got closet space. You don't know if they've been married five times, got 12 kids and all of that. Until you get married, then you find out all his money is, that's, you find out why he broke, because everybody else is getting his money. Is he 40 years old still living at home with his mama? And then men, are you marrying a woman who didn't have a father in the home? That can affect how she relates to you. She can say, Ain't no man going to tell me, uh, a man can't tell me what to do. He says, I, I believe the man ought to be the one who makes the final decisions in the home. Why you got to make a decision? How come it can't be me? Well, y'all work it out until y'all can come to an agreement. But somebody has to be ultimately responsible. If both of you can't agree and a decision has to be made, well, who's going to make the decision? You say, well, I'm, uh, he, don't know no, he don't know how to make a good decision. Well, why'd you marry him? <laughs> Listen, if the Bible says that, and Pastor Jackie mentioned this, you, the wife needs to submit to her husband. You got to say, am I willing to submit to this man? And if you're not willing to submit to him because you're not sure he can make good decisions, then do not marry him. So I can't, you know, he don't, he don't, we were at the restaurant and he couldn't even make no decisions. You can, you got the signs of me, oh, that's so cute. See, some of the same things that were so cute when you got married, when you were dating, you hate after you get married. You be like, He's, uh, he's, so, he's so thoughtful and contemplative. He just thinks through everything and mull over it. And then you get married to him. He won't talk and say nothing. Well, he's still thinking and contemplative like he thought he was. At first, you're telling your girlfriends, oh, girls, he's just a deep thinker. After you get married, he's just going to say nothing. He's just always thinking. He was doing the same thing he was doing. Observe any behavior that can be critical to you. Is the person possessive? Does your potential mate seem irrationally jealous whenever you, they interact with someone of the opposite sex? We talked about abusive behavior. Are they lazy? Can't get them to move. They won't do anything. They're not, they're not, they don't have any uh, get up and go. You want to look at all of that. Just listen, uh, I tell you before you get married, you need to have both eyes wide open looking at everything, checking everything out. I mean, you need to be meticulous and you need to be, just check it all out. Have both eyes open. And then after you get married, you need to close one of them. You say, I didn't see that, I didn't see that. So you do all your looking before you get married, and once you get married, just say, all right. <laughs> Notice any habitual behavior. Lottery tickets could be a sign of gambling issues. A display sign of drugs or alcohol abuse. Unexplained, unexplained absences or missed dates. Frequent car accidents. Smell of alcohol, erratic behavior, emotional swings. Uh, those are signs that something is going on. Unusual patterns. Can't be located. Uh, you got stuff missing from your house or your car. You, I know that was in here. Where, where is that? So ask a lot of questions. Ask him at different times, at different t places. Uh, don't interrogate, but be inquisitive. Uh, you can do a background check. If somebody don't have anything to hide, they don't have any problem with a background check. We have we use the 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 information that we have now. Years ago, see things are different. A generation or two ago, people weren't uh, as uh, mobile as they were, 
Uh, they didn't move around. They stayed in s different places. We, most, of, most people married somebody in their own neighborhood or in their own community 60 years ago. So people knew people. And people can talk to you about them. You can ask somebody about them. And you knew their family members. Most people married somebody that was in their community or family areas and, or schools, and you knew them. So somebody can tell you, oh, you don't want to be in that family. They're a bunch of drunkards. <laughs> you don't want to be in that family. Or, or those folks are hard workers over there. That's how they knew each other. We don't know people like we do that. You know, folks are, uh, in our area, they're, they're transient. They come from all different places. So uh, how are you going to know who they are? So you do a background check. Find out about them. That's not, that's not a problem. You checking up on me? Well, when they ask you that question, that's a sign. They got an issue. You don't trust me? You checking up on me? Uh, yes, I'm trust I trust you. I'm like Ronald Reagan. We're going to trust but verify You got a problem with that? See, you got to always be in a position where you say, I cut the cord any time now. You ain't got me so tied up that I, ain't, I'm, I'm, I don't want to cut the cord. Most people are like, oh, I don't want to lose them. I don't want to lose them. I don't want to lose them. You got to say, I'll lose you. That's somebody else. When God made one, he made two. Listen, there are some red flags. If you have an uneasy feeling that there is something wrong with your relationship, there's probably something wrong with your relationship. Uh, what about this? When all your family members and your friends say, uh, girl, maybe you better kind of uh, pray about it. Have you prayed about it? When they say that, you know what they're really saying? Woo, you need to run from that situation. They, they don't they want to hurt your feelings because you've been talking so, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, we're going to do this. And, and all they'll say is, well, have you prayed about it? That's a sign. Uh, are you sure? Now, because, you know, your friends, when they really think you got somebody good, they say, ooh, girl, I'm so happy for you. That's what they'll say. Ooh, I'm so happy. They'll be happy right along with you. But what if they ain't doing that, ain't none of them doing it. Everybody doesn't say, ooh, Lord. They're talking about you behind your back. That's what they're doing. <laughs> I don't know where she found him at. I thought there was something wrong with him the first time I saw him, but she can't see it. She can't see it. But she's so blind now. She's so blind now. I can't tell her nothing now. I don't want to hurt her feeling, but ooh, Lord, have mercy. They, they're telling you to slow down and run. If you find yourself arguing with your potential mate, guess what's going to be when you get married? See, because whatever's happened before you get married, it's going to get amplified after you get married. It ain't going to get no better. It's not going to get better. If there's an issue before you get married, it will not get better after you get married. It's going to get worse. Are you avoiding discussions, discussing certain subjects because you're afraid of your friend's reaction? So I don't want to talk about it because I don't know how they're going to act. Well, that's a sign. What about controlling behavior? They want to control every aspect of your life, your appearance, how you look, your lifestyle, your interaction with friend or family. They want to manipulate you into doing what they want you to do. That's a sign. You need to wonder about that. Are you continuing the relationship because of fear? That's a problem. Your fear of hurting your friends or finance or fear of what they might do if you ended the relationship. You had let it get to that point where they've really got you intimidated or fearful. It's not going to get any better. This special person shows a pattern of dishonesty and rationalized questionable behavior or twisting words to his and her benefits. You, you know, you're watching and you're seeing how they are are dealing with other people and all of those kind of things. Those are, are signs and things that you want, that you want to say, I'm, I'm not good with that. This person is unable to resolve conflicts. 
He or she can't deal with constructive criticism. They never admit a mistake. They're like Donald Trump. I've done nothing wrong. I've done nothing wrong. Nothing. Somebody asked him, Do you, did, have you ever asked anybody to forgive you? Forgive me? I've never done anything wrong. Now, you know what you can't tolerate. Don't try to take somebody who's not going to work out and try to make them work out. Listen, you call on the Lord and ask the Lord. Now, listen, if, if this is for believers now. We can trust God for almost everything else, but we seem not to trust him to be able to provide the kind of mate that's going to be a blessing to us. I had to get to the place in my personal life. I was single. I was in my 30s, mid-30s. Lord, you know who is best for me, and I'm trusting you to provide who's best for me. I'm, my first priority is to seek you first and give myself to you first, and you know how to meet my need. If I can trust you in my finances, I can trust you for my employment, I can trust you in my health, I can trust you in everything, I can trust you to provide the person who's going to be the best for me. I can trust you to do that. And some of us never ask the Lord. We ask the Lord for other stuff, but Lord, I got this one because I won't pick them myself. I'm going to pick them. <laughs> We're going to pick them. And then you're going to be praying to the Lord that he will unpick them for you. Here's something I tell uh, single people. It is better to wish you were married than to wish you were not. Because when you're in a bad marriage, you're going to wish every day. Oh, Lord. You're going to be praying for the Lord to do something. Do something, Lord. Come to my rescue. Any way you do it, I'll be satisfied. <laughs> Any way you do it, Lord, I'll be satisfied. Lord, you know what's best. No, you can't be praying for the Lord to pull the plug. The Lord said, no, you got into this. You, that's what you wanted. You made that decision. You didn't ask me. In all your ways, acknowledge the Lord, and he will direct your path. Now, some of you, I understand you're not, you're not that interested. You're not interested. You done got, uh, you said, you know what? I'm just glad I'm single because last time I was with somebody, it was so bad, I'm just going to be single the rest of my life. That's okay. But there are some that are desirous of a mate. And some are desirous of a mate and they never said anything to anybody. And you never really said much to God about it. You never even asked him. Say, Lord, I'm desirous of a mate. And I, I'm just asking you to bless me with who would be the best for me. That's what I would tell you if you're single and you desire a mate. God knows how to bless you. First of all, while you are in your singleness, do all you can to prepare yourself and get yourself so that you'll be able to be presented to someone and be a blessing to someone. You don't want to get married to somebody and then you're not even a blessing. You still got all these issues you're working on yourself. God, I got these things. I, I, I don't like nobody getting all close to me. See, you be saying all that. I don't want nobody close to me. Well, you want you want marry? You're probably going to get close to you. I can't stand other people in my business. All kind of stuff like that. You got to say, Lord, uh, whatever that's blocking me, my, myself, I want to I wanna feel good about who I am with you. I want to feel good about who I am with myself. Nobody else is going to come and make you feel good about you. You got to feel good about yourself and who you are. Here's what I want to do today. We're not helpless. We have God on our side. We want to dedicate our lives to God and making him a priority and first in our lives. 
God knows how to bless us. We ought to be getting things out of our lives that's going to be a, a barrier for God to move and for anybody to be welcome in our lives as well.